Okay, so now we're going to deal with comparability, which is the the second part of the functional analysis, right? I mean, functional analysis is part of your comparability analysis, um, and it surrounds everything which is not the functional analysis itself. It, it is, in other words, now that you know what the transaction actually is, now you're going to see if you can find comparable transactions elsewhere so that you can determine what the price for your internal transaction should be. The first chapter dealing with significance of comparability and comparability factors um, is actually thing, something that we've discussed already when we were dealing with um, our functional analysis in, in chapter two. So we're not going to spend a lot of time dealing with that. I would highly recommend that, that you go and look at the gold and green chart that we had of the functional analysis explaining all the steps because in the introduction to that, it also explains why we are doing this. The next is performing a comparability analysis. Here we will spend probably most of our time in this chapter going through the nine comparability steps of which the functional analysis is just one. And obviously there are other shorter ones such as figuring out for which years you're doing your comparability analysis, which typically should not take you more than 10 minutes either. But then there are other significant steps in the road to finding what the price for your transaction should be. We will deal with what to do when there's no comparable data. And here we will also look at uh, work of the John Transfer Pricing Forum um, to see what guidance was issued there. We will look at sources of information, both internal and external comparables. Um, I will talk a lot about uh, Transfer pricing professionals having a, I think, rather regrettable and irritating habit of rejecting in internal comparables, um, basically arguing why they are not comparables, and then going for external comparables where they know maybe 10% of the information that they know in an internal comparable, um, but then all of a sudden think that that would be qualitatively a better comparable. We have talked about secret comparables in the introduction. We'll touch base on it again briefly, basically saying that uh, the taxpayer should always be able to defend itself. Even if the government uses secret comparables, it should put forward the arguments against which the taxpayer can object. And then we'll talk about foreign com comparables. Um, there is a tendency for countries to prefer national comparables, but there's no reason when all other circumstances are equal, such as equal markets, equal spending power, etc., etc., why foreign comparables should not be acceptable as well. And then we'll deal with timing and compliance issues. We uh, already briefly talked about this when we discussed the meaning of the word contemporaneous um, as described in the, UNIL, uh, in the UN Practical Manual on Transfer Pricing. So let's get started. Okay, so let us look at what the nine comparability steps are, which one needs to fulfill to take, uh, to find the right arm's length price under a comparability analysis. Um, the first step, very simple one, you need to look at which years you're trying to price, right? That is a one-time affair one would hope, and then you know where you are. But the rest of the process is circular in the sense that you do the different steps. But it might be that, you know, the conclusion from one step leads you to, forces you to go back to another step or a lack of, of, of data in one step forces you to take another path, which means you have to do re, uh, redo other steps. So if we try to find the arm's length price for a transaction, what are steps two through to nine? The, the second step would be to determine the taxpayer circumstances. And what we typically mean here is you want to know what industry the taxpayer is operating in, how that industry functions, and where the taxpayer belongs in that industry. Is it a market leader? Is it following the trends? Is it a price fighter? Stuff like that. You also want to understand the control transactions. And this is your functional analysis that we talked about before. Once you've done that, you will try and see if there are any internal comparables. Now, remember what we said is, if one taxpayer sells something 
to a related party and sells the same thing to unrelated parties, that would be an internal comparable, right? If two unrelated parties sell the same thing to each other, that would be an external comparable. So first, you go and look and see if you can find internal comparables. And, and, and the internal comparables are preferable over external comparables simply because you at least know everything about one of the two parties, namely yourself, right? And, um, and then you don't know a lot about the other party, the external party. But think about it. If you look at an external comparable, you don't know much about either party. You may have a false sense of comfort because you have access to their balance sheets or their profit and loss accounts through the Chamber of Commerce. You have access to their websites. But to be very honest, I mean, on, on a transactional basis, you know nothing about the external party. But if you don't have any internal comparables, you have to go for external comparables, and the question is where to find them. Typically, one uses commercial databases. Bureau van Dijk is a is 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 a group which um, which are, is world known for 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 their databases. They they are um, Amadeus for Europe, Orbis for the world, or Cirrus is one I believe for Asia. And what they've simply done is they've collected millions and millions and millions of companies. Um, Profit and loss accounts, uh, balance sheets, um, whatever other data they could find about the group structure of these companies. They harmonize the, the, the data and then they put it into databases so you can study. Typically, these databases are very expensive to use. Um, I think unless you are a consultant doing at least 20 or 30 of these benchmark analysis every year, um, it becomes an expensive issue. Um, some companies do have access to, to these databases or they use other databases, but they all tend to be pricey. Um, and one should not rely on them in too much a fashion because they are, they've got an amazing amount of data, but they are also leaky. The data is not complete. Um, and you'll find this especially when you take one company or one group of companies and look at all the data that they have for a 10 year period. And you will see that there are huge gaps in, in that data. So it's something to bear in mind. The next step would be now that you find your comparables, you would have to say, well, what is the most appropriate method? And the reason why this step is following after the others is <clears throat> you only know what kind of data you have once you know what your potential comparables are. And, and the choice of your method is very much determined by the data that is available to you. If you have exact data of everything, then you can go for the cup. If you don't have exact data of everything, but you have a lot of data about particular transactions, which is unlikely because typically companies don't publish information on a transaction basis, then you could consider a cup or a resale minus. But if you don't have um, data available on a transactional basis and only on a P&L basis or profit and loss basis, then you have to follow basically the profit and loss account of, of a company and, and you get very quickly into, into the transactional net margin method where you say, I know that a company that only sells electric stuff, for instance, and is completely independent, according to their published accounts, they, they make an EBIT <coughs> of, let's say, 2% or 5% over their total costs of sale, for instance or they make an EBIT, which is 2 or 5% of their external turnover. And then I will apply the same to my own um, internal transactions. If you've chosen the appropriate method, then you need to go back and look at the comparables that you have and choose which ones are the most reliable, because you now your method also determines the choice of your comparables. If your method turns out to be cup then your potential then your potential comparables might be very narrow if your method is tnmm you might have a much wider range of comparables a far bigger number of comparables you would then make any comparability adjustments for instance let's say that you use your electronic seller 
um, as a comparable, but you know that in your own tonal transactions, you always give a 100% product guarantee, but this particular electronics seller gives no guarantee on, on, on the products or a one-year guarantee, not a lifetime guarantee, for instance. Then you've got to say, well, you've got to estimate, well, what, what was that difference in guarantee worth? And, you know, if I, if, if I give a longer guarantee than this external party, then I probably would want a little more because I do price the guarantee into the price of the product. And then when you finally made your comparability adjustments and you know the price that the third party is asking for its products, then you can say, okay, now I can finally price my product. And if the result seems reasonable, that's what you do. If the result does not seem reasonable or you're querying the result, you may very well go through some of these steps again and say, you know what, okay, I know the circumstances, I know I've done a proper functional analysis, but what about if I now don't do the, 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 the pricing under, under uh, TNMM, but I do it under uh, cost plus, for instance, only. So that's how you do your comparability steps. Before we start with comparability, let us start working on a case study that will make the material much more alive for us. So as you can see, we are selling and making tea here. And we have a principal and brand owner in the Netherlands, which is a Dutch company. And that company has leaf processing facilities in India and in Sri Lanka, where it, in other words, takes the leaves, have them dried, have them processed in such a way that they're ready for manufacture. And then those leaves are moved to Europe and they've got flavoring and packaging facilities in Holland and Belgium where the different flavors of teas are made, they're packaged, ready to be sold to supermarkets, consumers, etc. And then they have distribution centers in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and North America. And as we go through the comparability, we'll also go through the different methods. And in our case study, we'll say that the leaf manufacturing processing facilities in India and Sri Lanka are tall manufacturers, which means that they run no risk in their activities. Um, and it also means they don't take, for instance, inventory but the inventory remains the asset of the principal all the time, even if it's delivered from a supplier to the processing facilities, um, it still is legally the, the, the owner, the, 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 the asset of the principal in Holland. When Holland has the processed tea leaves produced to tea, it has contract manufacturing agreements with both the manufacturing companies in Holland and in Belgium, which means that it actually sells the processed tea leaves to these facilities. They package it and do everything that needs to be done and then sells it back to the principal. And then the principal has two types of distributors in the rest of the world. It has LRDs, which are limited risk distributors, which means that the principal sells the tea to the distributors who then sells it on to the customers, but typically in a low risk transaction where, for instance, the principal only legally delivers the tea to the distributor the moment before the distributor sells it on to the customer. In other words, the distributor has a lot of inventory um, of tea locally, otherwise it can't deliver it, but that inventory legally also belongs to the principal right until the moment that the distributor sells and delivers the tea to the customer. And then the principal has commissionaires, a dying breed of species due to BEPS, which means that um, the customer thinks that it is legally dealing with the commissionaire, the local company, um, but actually the person really being bound by the contract, for instance, if anything is wrong with the tea or the, dough or the packaging, is the principal, it's not the local distribution company. Another word for commissionaire is an undisclosed agent. So let us uh, dig into comparability and then we'll talk about that on the basis of this case study. And before we do the comparability itself, we'll actually just run through some numbers to give you an idea of, 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 of how these um, 
quantities look when, when dealing at, let's say, a medium-sized tea manufacturing group.